Today's sermon text is Galatians 2, 11 through 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have also... So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. You know, in high, sc- in high school, the quickest way to grab a uh, audience is yell, fight. You know, if someone said there's a fight going on, boy, a crowd just gathered and you wanted to know what was going on and what was the issue about, and fights seem to attract a crowd very, very quickly. Well, this is like a colossal collision here of these two spiritual giants between Paul and Peter. It's really a surprise. I mean, I, I cannot imagine the intense moment that this would be as Paul and Peter kind of have words. It, it's a shock, not just because they're both spiritual giants that you uh, as it was read to you, but it's a shock because just last time we looked at Galatians, uh, Paul had traveled to Jerusalem and had a private meeting with Peter, and it was all good. They they rallied around the gospel. The gospel is singular. It's one for Jew and Gentile. We don't need to bring the old law to bear on the Gentiles' lives. And, and they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship, so everything was hunky-dory. It was a, a disaster was averted. There's one gospel. But then with Paul, but then when Peter comes to Antioch, it's a different situation. I mean, Paul gets right in his cage. He gets right in his cage and he begins to call him out for no longer eating with the Gentiles anymore. Peter has separated himself from those with whom he was eating. And, and, and this is a big deal. You know, Paul is trying to make sure that there's just not one gospel, but we don't want to have two tables with one gospel. There's just one table around which we fellowship and serve. And so what Paul's doing here is you, you really have a unique opportunity. You have a text which records a conflict that Paul had with Peter. And Paul confronts Peter's compromised gospel. It, it, that's what he's doing here. In 11 to 14, he's challenging a compromised gospel. And then in 15 to 21, Paul clarifies the gospel for Peter. He, he reminds him of what he, what he understands. Peter's orthodoxy is not being challenged. It's his orthopraxy. It's what he's doing with it. So let's look at the compromising of the gospel. How does the gospel get lost in all that noise? And, and then how do we then clarify the gospel so that we, we really are on the right side of right and not just on our side of right? Uh, so look with me at 11 to 13. Paul's challenging this compromised gospel. He says, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And that's why you don't hear anything from Peter, by the way. Peter never makes a response to the whole thing. Why? Because he doesn't have one. I opposed him to his face. He stood condemned for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy. So let me just try to paint the scene a little bit. You kind of already know, you feel the flow of it already. So Peter's in Antioch. Antioch is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. 
but it has a large Jewish population. And so he's there and he's fellowshipping with these Gentile believers. He's eating with them. He's worshiping with them. They're celebrating the Lord's table together. They're having the meal after uh, the supper. They're enjoying one another in the things of God. Um, everything's great. Now, you, you can, you, you got to get in the mindset of this kind of cultural struggle. I mean, this is a big deal. Peter is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He's a Jew, and he's with us Gentiles, and he's eating with us. I, I mean, a Jew would, would not even darken the doorway of the home of a Gentile, let alone eat with them, let alone eat their food. But Peter's doing it all. In fact, Paul says, you're living like a Gentile. You're living like one of them. And so they're just imagining, this is incredible. I mean, can you, this is the power of the gospel. It breaks racial divides. It breaks ethnic distinctions. Here, Peter from Jerusalem is in with all these Gentiles. Can you imagine? I mean, it had to be a landmark time of rejoicing that we're together in the gospel. Look at it. Peter's here among us. Now, Peter's didn't wake up one day and move in this direction. Remember now, when Peter was walking with Jesus in Mark 7, uh, Jesus confronts the Pharisees and he instructs his disciples that it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And then, of course, Mark gives the interpretation of that. He says, rendering all foods clean. So, so Peter did have the seeds of this idea in his mind. But, but the real uh, the real watershed moment for Peter is when he was in Acts chapter 10. So Acts chapter 10, you can read it later. It's an incredible story. Peter's on the roof of a house and he's praying. Now, while Peter's praying, an angel appears to Cornelius in another town and says, go get Peter. And, and so this guy then sends some servants to go get Peter, but they're Gentiles. But Peter's having this prayer time on the roof, and all of a sudden he has this trance, a vision from God. And he sees this sheet coming down with all these unclean creatures in it. And so he hears this voice from heaven. This is in Acts 10, 13. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So that would indicate that even after Peter came to faith and was walking as an apostle, he still was maintaining these dietary restrictions from the old covenant. And the voice came to him and again said a second time, well, God has made clean, do not call common. Three times this vision comes and, and he sees it. And then all of a sudden when the vision's taken away, a knock is on the door and they say, hey, can you come over and and see us at Cornelius' house, and a bunch of Gentiles gather together. He goes there, he preaches. They all come to faith, and then the Spirit of God lands upon all of them. Now, this is called the Gentile Pentecost, just like in Acts 2, so in Acts 10. So this is mind-bending. This is mind-bending. Here, Jew and Gentile, same gospel, same spirit. So, so you see how Peter's being changed. Now, in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council, Peter's going to argue for the unity of Jew and Gentile. He says these words in chapter 15, verse 8. Peter stood up and said, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So that's what Peter's understanding. Peter gets it. Everything's going great, right? Until certain men from James came. And that's what you see. Until sir, We don't know who these men are. We don't know if James sent them or if they just claim to be from James. But they are clearly strict Jewish Christians who are still maintaining a degree of rigidity with the old law, with dietary restrictions. They're called the circumcision party. See, they, they preach that you have to believe in Jesus is the Messiah. So Jesus was the promise of God. He's the child of promise. He's going to bring about salvation. And you have to also, uh, so that we can display to the world that we're God's people, you have to eat a certain way. You got to get circumcised. You got to keep the Sabbath. This is the way everybody knows you're a child of God. And so they begin to press on Peter. They begin to ta chastise him. So well, what about you and your Jewish heritage? Come on, you're, you're, you're from the tribe of Israel. You have to do these things. And they put pressure on him. 
And he began to fear the circumcision party such that he backed away. It says the rest of the Jews, and it says even Barnabas got led astray. I mean, what happens here is, you know, he's retreating. When it says that they withdrew, that's a military term. It means you, you turn tail and you run. I mean, you're retreating. That's what he did. You see, Peter began to now compromise the gospel, introducing a distinction that had been removed and that Peter saw it. So you see now Peter adding to the gospel. Well, yeah, we got to believe but you guys do. You really should start eating differently uh, like we've been told by God to do. So that's the scene. So then Paul comes blasting into the place and he goes right up to him. Look with me at 14. He says, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like the Jew. So Paul's not just being argumentative. He's not kind of vying for a key place in the apostolic kingdom here. He, he sees something incredibly important at stake, this introduction of division within the unity that the gospel brings. And so he calls Peter out. He calls him hypocrite. He says, you're a hypocrite. When you're with the Jews, you live like the Jews. When you're with the Gentiles, you live like the Gentiles. He goes, he, he's not questioning Peter's orthodoxy. He's not questioning Peter's conviction of faith, but how it's being meted out, how he's playing it out, how he's living. There's a distinction between, between his belief in the gospel and his behavior in the gospel. And you see that when Paul says, but I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. This is incredibly important. You can believe the right things. If you're not doing the right things, that, that gap as it exists and extends itself can run you right out. I mean, it, it begins to show this, this great, it causes confusion among those looking at you, but it causes confusion in your own mind. What do I believe? And why am I not living the way I'm believing? So that's kind of the scene here. There's this fight. It's a confrontation. So, so what do we do with this? Well, let me just stop right here for a minute. And, and let me just give you a few ideas to consider. How do we compromise the gospel today? How do we do this same kind of thing? How do we add layers to the gospel? How do we avoid having this kind of confrontation? Well, well number one, I, I would just say that um, even giants fall. I, I, I mean, realize that spiritual people stumble and fall at various points in their life. I mean, Peter has clay feet. Did you see what happened? It says, in fear of the circumcision party. We don't know what he was fearing. Maybe he was fearing, fearing that he was going to be ostracized. Maybe he was going to lose a place of honor in the Jerusalem church. Maybe he feared persecution. Maybe he feared being pushed out of the inner circle. Uh, we don't know, but we know that he's wilted before, back before the crucifixion of Christ. We see that apostles can fail. This is really important for us to see. James says in chapter 3, verse 2, we all stumble in various ways. I mean, all of us do. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been in the faith that we are susceptible to giving way, to melting under pressure from people. I mean, don't underestimate. Please don't underestimate, you know, the pressure that comes upon you, the threat of a lost job that your faith is just going to immediately, this is the reason that we gather together. We support one another. We need one another. You know, the pressure that comes on, or even the pressure uh, to conform to whatever the in-group is. You know, don't underestimate that. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote an essay on the inner ring. The inner ring was kind of that group that everybody always wants to be a part of. It's the group of lookalikes, they're the notables, the respectables, they're the, the people that you want to be. And here's what he said about the inner ring. He said, I believe that in all men's lives at certain periods, and in many men's lives at all periods, between infancy and extreme old age, one of the most dominant elements is the desire to be inside the local ring and the terror of being left outside. This idea that, that if you don't conform, if you don't compromise on what you believe and how you live, if you don't do that, then you're not going to be part of the inner ring. This isn't just high school stuff. This, this is our day. and This is adults face the same. I want to be in that ring. I want to be accepted by these people. I want to be part of this group. 
and, and we're willing to compromise and soften the gospel. When, when you look at your own life and how you behave at work or in the community or even in the broader context of this church or your family, do you see areas where you're willing to compromise? Do you see areas willing, where you're willing to be silent and maybe not say anything, maybe not stand up for somebody that's really getting assailed by somebody else? Maybe just going quiet or maybe walking away. You know, the fear of man in Proverbs 29, 25, it's a snare. It's a trap. So that's one thing we learn from this. Don't underestimate the pressure that can come on you. We don't want to compromise in our life as it relates to the gospel. And you will face those temptations every day. But not only do we want to realize that even giants fall, we want to reconcile these gaps in our life. And notice what he said, your conduct is not in step. It's not in line with the truth of the gospel. Now, for Peter's case, he's backing away along racial lines. He's separating. He wants them to become like him. It is amazing how, this is one way we do the same thing. We, we move along tribal lines. Who's like us? Our color, our ethnicity, our background, our socioeconomic position. Now, we'll be cordial in church. We'll be cordial on the street. But do we make the efforts to actually have people that are different from us in our lives around a table? It isn't just sharing a meal with them. Sharing a meal in this context was sharing life with them. To what degree do we bust up our personal tribes to include others? Because if we just always hang around a bunch of lookalikes, then, then there's really no wisdom being displayed about the glory of God and the unity that we have in the church. There's all kinds of reasons they're united. You can see them on all the external features. So, so I think it's a challenge to us. Narrow the gaps between what you believe. You believe, yeah, all colors, yep, all peoples were saved by the gospel. How does that look in your life? Does anybody ever see that? I mean, that, that's just not racial lines, though. It's also political lines. Do you have a, do you have a Democratic friend? I mean, a, a lot do. Do you have a Republican friend? I mean, can you be friends with a person from another political party holding to different political views than you? Or, or what about educational or, or, or lifestyle lines? This is the way we raise our kids. This is the way we eat our food. And that, it doesn't mean that you won't be cordial with those who do it different public or do it different than you, but, but there's just no real commonality between the two. There's not a lot of crossing of lines there. This is my tribe. This is how I behave. This is, we all think and look alike. And he's just saying it, it's not sinful to be in either camp. It's just these camps can't stay isolated from one another. I think that's his point. We can't create two tables of which we're fellowshipping. We've got the same gospel, but well, we just do life differently on these two things. So, so it's a challenge to us to narrow the gaps, to see what levels of hypocrisy exist in our own life, and then to begin to narrow those gaps by intentionally crossing lines that maybe have just formed over time. But not just narrowing the game. Also, recognize that, you're, that these sins of hypocrisy that we have in the church, they do impact others. We don't sin in a vacuum. I mean, all of our sins affect others. You see, Peter's sin affected the rest of the Jews and even Barnabas himself. I mean, our sins affect others. Parents, you know this. Your children are, off advertise, your children are often advertisements of your own sin. I, I mean, they are walking out what you do oftentimes. And so recognize that there's, a, there's a, a reverberating effect of our sin upon others. It isn't self-contained, as you may hope. Well, they don't really see that. They do. And, and then remember the value of a rebuke. I mean, if you think about what Paul did. So Peter was an apostle. He was one of the three. He saw the resurrection he had Jesus himself reinstate him. I mean, he is a, a top dog, right, in this apostolic world. And yet Paul throws caution to the wind and he calls him out. Now, the first time he saw him, he saw him in private because they were trying to work out the details of the gospel. But here, as sin's public, he goes after him publicly, goes right after him. And he does it because the sin was public. It affected more than just Peter and his friends. It affected the churches. And so Paul goes after him publicly. 
It takes a lot of courage to do that. But, you know, Paul's going to write on this later. In chapter 6 of Galatians, he says, uh, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. In other words, Paul's saying, if someone's caught in a sin, those don't sit by and let them sit in it. But go in gentleness and restore him, challenge him, rebuke him. Do you have anybody in your life that feels comfortable to bring correction to you in your life? Have you ever invited anybody to say, and has anybody ever done it, and, and to say, you know, if you see something in me that needs correcting, would you please bring it to my attention? Particularly in marriage. I see this is the one place that we should do it. We don't. We're terrified to do it either male to female or, or female to male. It goes both ways where, you know what, if, if you bring correction, I mean, you're in the, you're in the uh, penalty box for a while, and it's going to take you a while to get out. And I'll tell you, it, we, are, we are fools to do that. We're fools. Because if you think that between your ears, and if I think between my ears, then I've got all the wisdom I need to see all the issues in my life and to bring correction to all those things. We're fools. We're just, I mean, we're so self-deceived. You know, David says, let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It's oil on my head. Let my head not refuse it. It, it takes courage. You know, Paul did this because remember back in chapter one, he said, listen, if I was trying to seek the approval of man, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. It, it, it takes you thinking, no, I, got, I have to seek, I have to be a servant. I can't seek their approval by avoiding correction. And, and then the last thing I think we see in this confrontation is resist the temptation to add layers to the gospel. You have to resist temptation to add layers. You know, we want to say it is Jesus, but it really would be smart if you also did this, read this version of the Bible or wore this kind of clothing, or ate this kind of food, or watched these kind of shows, or did this kind of education. It's so easy to layer those things on. And here's why. <clears throat> because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel good. If we're doing what we think we ought to be doing, we feel good. And if we're doing what we think we should be doing, we even feel better when we see other people don't, they're not doing it. You know, this idea of self-justification, Ray Ortland's a modern-day theologian, he says, self-justification, he said, it is, it is the strongest impulse of the human heart. We want to be right. We want to be justified. We want to feel like we're doing it on our own. We want to be adding to this work. It, it, it's a terrible thing because it begins to layer on the gospel. It begins to change the gospel. That when we begin, and we see that in small forms when we begin to separate people, even though they're Christian, but they're doing it differently than us. You know, J.C. Ryle, even 150 years ago, he said, you can spoil the gospel. He goes, you can spoil it. He says, the gospel is, in fact, the most curiously and delicately compounded medicine. And it's a medicine that is very easily spoiled. He said, you can spoil the gospel by substitution. You have only to withdraw from the eyes of the sinner, the grand object of the Bible, Christ, and to substitute another object in his place, the church, the ministry, the confessional, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and mischief is done. You can spoil the gospel by addition. You only have to add to Christ, the grand object of faith, some other object equally is worthy of honor and mischief is done. You can spoil the gospel by disproportion. You have only to attach an exaggerated importance to the secondary things of Christianity and a diminished importance to the first things. That's where we are. And the mischief is done. You can spoil the gospel. So what Paul's doing is confronting Peter. He says, don't spoil the gospel. Don't compromise the gospel. So that's the first thing. It's a good warning for us to hear. It's really good to see just simply the gospel. Well, what is that? Well, that's what Paul gets to in 15 through 21. Paul's going to bring three clarifications to the gospel. Now, this 15 to 21 is incredibly dense. It's incredibly dense. As, as Allie was reading it, you're, as she was going through the verses, particularly 17 and 18 and 19, you're thinking, 
what is he saying here? It's dense. And I know that many of you have read deeply on this section of Scripture. And I know that many of you don't remember the last time you read this Scripture. And, and so I'm trying to find a degree of being simple without being simplistic. But if I raise questions in your mind, I live with you. I'm here every week. Just ask. So, so we're going to see three clarifications. You see that in this argument that Paul is having, he's still talking to Peter. So it's still, it's a recording of what he said, and it's going to the churches. So he's clarifying for Peter the gospel. Why? Because we can lose it. We can confuse it. We can add to it. We can subtract from it. So the first thing he clarifies is that we are saved. We are justified before God through faith and not by works. This is much more dense than you think. You can't imagine. Justification, good works, faith are all theological terms that pages and pages are written about what they mean. But look with me back at 15 and 16. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. Now, let me just pause here for a minute. You see what he's saying here? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, don't think that Paul's taking some racial line again. He's not saying, well, they're Gentile sinners. and We're Jews by birth. We're somehow better than they are. He's doing the opposite. He's confronting Peter who thinks that. They thought that Gentiles, one of the old Jewish prayers was, thank God I'm not a Gentile slave or woman. You hear the prejudice in that. That's one of their old prayers. So they saw the Gentiles. They didn't have the law. They were sinning, both by choice and by ignorance. But the Jews, they had the law. They had the covenants. They understood the things of God. And they walked in line with that. And what Paul is saying here is we are Jews by birth. They may be Gentile sinners. We're Jews by birth. And yet we still are justified through faith. So Paul's saying even though we're Jews and we have the law, or we're Christians, and we're all good, cleaned up people, we're still justified through faith and not by works of the law. Now, what does works of the law mean? Well, many people want to restrict it and say, well, they're just boundary markers of, of Judaism, their baptism, and, or um, circumcision, and dietary laws, and Sabbath keeping. I, I would probably tend to go with a broader application of what the works of the law are, uh, being more of the whole Mosaic law. And, and these, uh, these folks, Peter and these friends from James, uh, they were seeing that they were meritorious. Yes, you believe in Jesus. But if you don't do these things, it evidences you really don't believe in Jesus. So it acts in a meritorious way. That I'm somehow earning favor with God by doing these things. And what Paul's saying is, no, you're justified through faith, not by those things. Now, you put your own works of the law in. Well, you know, we don't worry about circumcision today as a work of the law, but whatever your works of the law are, if you begin to see them as putting you in better and better position with God, he's saying, no, we're not justified through works of the law, but through faith. Now, justification is an immense word. It's very important. Uh, to be justified means this. What Paul is saying is that Jew and Gentile alike are under the condemnation of God because they've repeatedly broken the law of God. And so they're guilty. We're guilty as charged. There is no, there's no slick talking attorney that's going to bail us out. We're guilty. The evidence is in, you're guilty. And what justification is, is God looks upon us graciously and gives pardon. He, he gives us forgiveness. He accepts us. He says, we're, I'm not going to hold this against you anymore. Because what Christ has done, he's died for your sins, he's been raised for your justification. So because of the merits of Christ, I will not hold you guilty. J.I. Packer says it this way. He says, to justify in the Bible means to declare a man who is on trial, that he is not liable to any penalty, but he's entitled to all of the privileges due to those who kept the law, due to Christ who kept the law. Justifying is one act of a judge pronouncing the opposite of condemnation, that is acquittal and legal immunity. So what he's saying is that we're justified, we're made right with God, we're accepted, we can be children of God because he is gracious to us and because of the merits of Christ. 
And this justification comes through faith, not you agreeing mentally to the idea. It's not mental consent alone. There's a trust. You're no longer looking at what you do with Jesus. It's what he has done for you alone. So let me give you a test. This is a small test. Pop quiz is what it is. So do you feel, and nobody has to answer this out loud, uh, do you feel accepted by God right now? Do you feel that God has accepted you fully as his child? Now, if your answer is yes, then I would say, on what basis? But why do you think God would accept you? I mean, really, I mean, if we all were honest with each other, why in the world would God accept you? It, it wouldn't even be the ant to the king of the land. That, that difference would pale in comparison to us and God. Why would he accept you? Well, if you say yes, then why? And then I say, well, why? And if you start going through your Rolodex of what you've become and what you've done and who you've, who you've turned out to be and, and the faithfulness that you have, or even if you said, because I have faith, as if you're bringing faith to the table, like it's a, it's a work that you're providing for God. I would say you're wrong. The, the answer is, why am I accepted? Well, because of what he has done. Not anything that I added to his work later on, once I became a Christian, it's his work and his work alone. Uh, th that is what we find. That's what Paul's saying. We're justified through faith. Faith itself is a gift to you. So if you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, let it be known to you that that's out of God's sheer kindness. That, that if you have to muster up faith and bring it, that's just another work like going to church. So what Paul's saying here is incredibly important. We're justified through faith is an instrument. God even gives us that to believe. And if you find yourself resting in his work alone, then you find acceptance. Paul's saying if you're adding to it, you don't. That's why he says in 21, if righteousness can be achieved through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. His death was a waste. Now just let him give us more grace so we can do a few more good things, add to the pile and make it in. So we say, no, no, we're justified through faith alone, through faith alone. But notice the next thing he says. Secondly, he said, well, first he says, we are justified by, through faith, not by works. Then he says, we're no longer under the law. Now look with me here at 17 to 19, because this is where it gets a little deep. He says, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Now, I, I think Paul's facing an opposition here. He's facing these Judaizers who are saying, what kind of gospel are you preaching? If you just tell everybody they can just believe and be saved, they're going to live lives that are just train wrecks. They'll be spiritual anarchists. They're going to just open the floodgates of sin. Yeah, I got a little Jesus. I, I had a person tell me at a wedding I just went to, you just got to love Jesus. Sleeping with his girlfriend, living in all kinds of ways. Just got to love Jesus. That's what they're opposing. They're saying, Paul, that's what your gospel is going to breed. Spiritual anarchy. But notice how Paul argues with it. This is incredible, the argumentation that Paul brings. He says, certainly not. He's saying, God forbid. He said, no, if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. What he's saying is they're accusing Paul of tearing down the law. You've torn down the law, Paul. You've torn it down. Now people are going to go crazy. They're going to believe in Jesus, do whatever they want. You've got to add law to it. He says, if, if I rebuild what I tore down, then I'm, I'm back to being a sinner again because now I'm living back under the law and I'm guilty under the law. Nobody can live under the law. Everybody's guilty. He said, if I rebuild that, if I bring the law back on top of the gospel, I myself am a transgressor again. And so are you. Look what he says. He says, for through the law, I died to the law so I might live to God. Through the law, I died. Do you realize that the law that God gave to us, the Mosaic law, was not a law that could ever save? It, it could never prevent sin. It actually kind of produced a type of sin because it made us aware of our sin. You know, so you and I, let's say we're driving down the road and we're going 75 miles an hour and all the cars are swinging on by us. And we're thinking, you know, wow, we are really going slow here. And then all of a sudden we see a speed limit sign and it says 70. Well, now we get, oh, we're breaking the law. Well, once that law appeared, now we know 
Oh, we, we just broke the law. The sign doesn't get me to slow down. It doesn't change my driving habits at all. You can see it 540 all the time. It doesn't do anything about that. But it doesn't change us, but it alerts us to understand that we've now broken the law. It can't save. And so Paul says, through the law, I died to the law. Paul died. It, metaphorically speaking, he died. He was condemned. He had no answer. The law drives us to Christ to say, we can't do it. Paul, a Pharisee, he tries harder and harder and harder. And it's like this badger just digging deeper and deeper and deeper. He's working hard and he's going down deeper in sin. And so the law is meant to say, you can't do it. The Messiah, the promised one, has come to save you in a way you can't save yourself. He died to the law. Now, notice what he says following. He says, in 20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Now, what's he mean by this? Well, this is how we died. This is how we died to the law. We've been crucified with Christ. Now, I know none of us here and Paul himself was not actually, literally crucified with Christ. I know that. But Paul is speaking of Christ as the representative. Adam was a representative to humanity. Jesus is a representative for all who have faith in him. So we send a representative to Washington, right? We have a couple senators. We send them up there. They're representing us. They're speaking for us. We're in them in a way, right? They may not always vote the way we want them to vote, but they are representing us. They are standing in our stead. They are our voice in Washington. Jesus is our representative. He is in our stead. We died with him. And once you die to the law, then you're no longer bound to the law. So we as Christians, those who have been justified by through faith, no longer look at the law as we once did, as kind of this taskmaster governing and bringing condemnation to us. That's the second thing he was saying. The third thing he was saying was that we now live by faith in the Son of God. We live by faith in the Son of God. You see this in 20 and 21. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is He's saying we're not bound by law anymore. So for the Christian here who, through faith, who trusts in the work of Christ, we've died to the law. It no longer has sway over us. But we do now live by faith. We're not going into moral weakness. We're not going into spiritual anarchy because we're now living by faith. We're trusting in Christ who has reconciled us to God. But now we're going to live in holiness. We're going to follow Christ the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Our obedience to God isn't driven by keeping some, you know, jot and tittle of the law. Our obedience to Christ now is motivated by love. He loved us and he gave himself for us. It's a huge move of affections drive the holiness of the Christian. Love drives the holiness of the Christian. He loved us and we love him or we ought to. And he gave himself for us. There's no greater gift that you'll get on this world that he gave himself for us. And that is this encouragement Then I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to look to please him. He's the master. I, I, I now live for him. He lives in me. I want to live in him. That's what Paul's driving at here. He's giving us freedom that we can do this together. So a clarified gospel, what does it do for us? A clarified gospel removes guilt from us, that, that, that suffering that you go through when you're agony, I didn't do this, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do this. It, it's not moving us towards antinomianism. It's not moving us towards just spiritual anarchy, but it's moving us to, he paid for that. He paid for that. So every time the guilt and the, and the pain comes on, he paid for that. He paid for that. For every look at you, look at you, for every look you take of yourself, take 10 of Christ, Robert Murray McShane said, he paid for that. There's a peace with that. It helps us sleep at night. Michael Horton is a modern-day theologian, and he said, my conscience doesn't render a positive verdict in God's courtroom when I take a look at myself. The only reason I can sleep well at night is that even though my heart is filled with corruption, and even though I'm not doing my best to please him, I have in heaven at the Father's right hand a beloved son who has not only done his best for himself, but has fulfilled all righteousness for me in my place. In other words, he has given us 
his righteousness. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5, we read that we, that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. He gives to us his perfect righteousness. He takes our sins away. He gives to us his righteousness. So now we stand in Christ. We're before God, guiltless, forgiven. If this engenders you to go live wild tonight, you don't get what I'm saying. If it engenders you to say, I want to follow him with everything I have, then you're getting to what I'm saying. So it takes that, you know, when Gresham Machen died, he died on this, uh, January 1, 1937. He, he was the founder of the OPC, Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and he started at Westminster Theological Seminary. Here's where his last words, he says, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. We have no hope without it. If Christ was righteous before their father, well done, my good and faithful servant. We in him are great. So we can sleep at night. Secondly, a clarified gospel really identifies who the Christian is. Christians aren't identified by what they wear or the dresses or the, um, the versions of the Bible or how they eat or how they don't eat or how they drink. Or how. Christians are identified by those who love Christ. You can see the Christian by the forgiveness and the mercy I mean, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, for the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died and have died for all. And those uh, and for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but live for him who for their sake died and was raised. We're known now by how we love and how we follow Christ. And, And the last thing I would say is simply this. That a clarified gospel uh, brings about a culture of the gospel in the church. In other words, we may be pure in our doctrine. You may get this. Everything I've said, you're like, yeah, I heard it already. Maybe you know all this. But if we're not living it in this church, then we're not getting it. That's Peter's problem. Peter's orthodoxy was correct. His practice was wrong. If this, if the glory of this truth that you just heard, if it's not meted out by the way that we forgive, love, cross racial lines, cross political lines, cross there, any other line, if, if the gospel doesn't meet itself out by the way that we love, serve, care, forgive, admonish, rebuke, strengthen, help, if it doesn't take place, or if it just gets in your tribes, then, then we're missing it. It's a scary thing. You can have the gospel so close and not be enjoying it. That it has to look the gospel just as we believe the gospel. Now, none of us are going to do it perfectly. There's always going to be gaps. But that's what we're going to see. A clarified gospel is the gospel of the church. Listen to what one author said. He says, the gospel does more than renew personally within. See, we don't want to go this pietistic this individualistic approach to, no, I believe that gospel. It can't be believed apart from practiced in the body. He says the doctrines of grace also create a culture of grace. It's called a healthy church where the gospel is articulated at the level of doctrine and it's incarnated at the level of culture and vibe and ethos and feel and relationships and community. He says what stands out in my mind about Galatians is that Paul considers gospel culture just as sacred as gospel doctrine. He fought for that culture because the doctrine of grace justification cannot be preserved in its integrity if it's surrounded by a culture of self-justification. And that's something we all got to do. It's the cult. We want to walk in that culture. We want to create that culture. How do we do it? Well, we do it by loving one another, by forgiving one another, by going and grabbing people who don't know and love and find out about their life serving one another, sacrificing for one another, that's going to create a culture of justification through faith alone. I know I have dumped a truckload on you. He simply is confronting this compromise of the gospel, and he's clarifying the beauty of the gospel. Let's just take a moment and just ask God to open our eyes. I want you to ask God to open your eyes to the truth of this that it might not just be purity in doctrine, but also purity in your practice, and I'll pray for us.
Father, I pray that as a people, you would overwhelm us by your grace, unmeasured, clearly, overwhelming. Father, help us. Father, help us, A, understand and believe and rest in this doctrine that if we were to if we were to consider how are we accepted, that it's in Christ and Christ alone, and, and we, we enjoy that, we enjoy that rest through faith, but, but may it move and create a culture of grace and, and forgiveness and love. Lord, you've given us a wonderful church, God, but we want to continue to grow in, our, in a deeper understanding, in a, more, in a more profound way of living it out. Lord, grant to us not just to believe in this gospel of grace, but grant us the grace to live in light of it. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Please stand.